So it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew Capriotti. Um, he's an associate professor of psychology at San Jose State University. Um, prior to joining the faculty at San Jose State, Dr. Capriotti completed his PhD in psychology at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 2015 and completed pre and postdoctoral fellowship training in the UCF de UCSF Department of Psychiatry um, and Behavioral Sciences um, Clinical Psychology Training Program. For the past 10 years, Dr. Capriotti has conducted research aimed at developing, testing, and bringing to scale effective behavioral intervention, tick disorders, and related conditions. Dr. Capriotti um, regularly conducts trainings on behavioral treatment of tick disorders in conjunction with the Tourette Association of America. And he was a leading organizer of the 2018 Treating Tourette Together Summit, which brought together over 40 stakeholders from across the US and Canada to develop an, a patient-centered research agenda for behavioral treatment of tick disorders. He is also an active researcher in the area of LGBTQ plus health and was a founding associate director for mental health in the PRIDE study. Dr. Capriotti's scholarly work has culminated in 37 peer review publications, seven book chapters, and 61 conference presentations. Um, please join me in uh, giving a warm welcome to Dr. Matthew Capriotti. Thank you so much for being here. And I will go ahead and mute myself now. Take it away. Everyone, thanks so much for having me. It's really good to be back, albeit virtually, uh, in the department. Um, it's been a pleasure to be able to keep in touch with a lot of y'all since I wrapped up my fellowship, and it's good to see some familiar names and, and faces today. Um, and a big thanks to Dr. Barbara Stewart and Dr. Lauren Hack for inviting me. So I'm going to jump right in. Oh, wait. No, I'm not. Sorry. Uh, uh, um, after that introduction, I don't need to brag on myself, but I will brag on my department a little and mention that we're hiring and send this job ad quickly in the chat. Um, we're hiring an ass assistant professor of clinical psychology at San Jose State with expertise in health and wellness in community color. So I'll, I'll get to the, the talk now, but that's my self-promotion for our department. It's a great place to work. And if you're looking for a job, come join us. Um, all right, so this should be set up where I'm presenting and we're rolling now. These are my financial disclosures. Uh, I get speaking fees for doing these trainings on uh, behavior therapy for Tourette syndrome. I don't make any money off of the sale manuals or anything like that. Um, and you can see a list of some recent uh, grant funding that I've had. Today's talk, what I'll do is briefly overview ticks and Tourette syndrome. Uh, then I'll overview CBIT, which is Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Ticks, uh, go into a summary of tele-CBIT research and some related research, um, basically looking at different ways to implement and scale up this uh, evidence-based treatment for Tourette syndrome, and then talk about some future directions and lesson learned. So just briefly, this is a teletherapy and implementation research story. That's what I hope it is today. This is not a comprehensive synthesis of the literature on Tourette syndrome. This is also not a CBIT didactic. Um, so forgive me if those parts are, are briefer than you'd like. Uh, I am doing a CBIT didactic, I think in May, with the CAT fellows, and I'd be able to open that up or, or record that and make it available to folks or something like that. But today is, is just going to say enough about the treatment to give you an idea yeah. of where, um, in this research story. Start with... Um, some basics. All oh, right, it's working. Slide share. I think San Jose um, State has job openings. Here we see uh, Dr. Gilles de la Tourette here, a gif of him. He's the French neurologist who first characterized Tourette syndrome. Um, and what we see him doing is displaying some classic motor tics. Um, so tics are defined by the DSM as a sudden, rapid, recurrent, non-rhythmic stereotype motor movement or vocalization. Pretty technical definition. Basically, these are kind of rapid, ballistic uh, motor sounds. They can be simple, um, where there are these quick, purposeless movements, eye blinking, uh, eyebrow raising, head jerking, these kind of things. Or they can be more orchestrated or more involved movements. 
Similarly, vocal tics can be simple vocal tics, so sniffing, grunting, throat clearing, that sort of thing, or more complex vocal tics that might involve words or phrases. People talk a lot about coprolalia, which is swearing tics. That's kind of a widely publicized sign of the disorder. Really, that happens for less than 10% of folks um, who, who experience Tourette's syndrome. So yeah, pretty much any movement or sound can, can pop up as a tick. And ticks do, importantly, tend to wax and wane both over the course of day to, day to day, hour to hour, and on a longer time scale, week to week and month to month. I won't spend too much time on diagnosis. Um, a couple important things to know, I'll go to the fourth bullet, is that Tourette syndrome, now Tourette disorder, DSM, is one of the few conditions maybe the only condition where impairment is not required for diagnosis. So when I'm talking about this 1% of folks with chronic or persistent tic disorders, that really encompasses a whole range of folks um, who have chronic tics and maybe have very minimal impairment or virtually no impairment, all the way up to really life debilitating tics that are causing a whole lot of impairment and a whole lot of distress. Uh, when I say Tourette syndrome or Tourette disorder, all this refers to is the chronic presence of at least two motor tics and at least one vocal tic that an individual has at some point in the course of their life. If someone has just movement tics, that's called persistent motor tic disorder. Um, collectively, I'll just call these tic disorders and I might slip into just using Tourette syndrome to refer to all of them together. Just briefly about the causes of Tourette syndrome. So, Tics um, and Tourette syndrome on the whole are highly heritable. There's a complex genetic transmission that um, we're beginning to understand better and better over the last decade, thanks in part to the work of folks in the UCSF psychiatry department, um, in no pa small part, Dr. Matt State and his colleagues. Um, so complex polygenetic transmission happening there. Um, on the brain level, what we see is disruption in motor planning and motor execution circuitry. Uh, particularly a loop um, called the corticostriatothalamocortical loop, uh, the brain's motor planning and motor selection system, and that we see hyperdopaminergic functioning along this circuit. Um, I won't go in much more there just for the scope of today's talk, although there's obviously a lot more to say there. As far as the course of Tourette syndrome, ticks tend to onset right around age five or six for most folks. Um, almost everyone who will have chronic tics has an onset by age seven. Tics tend to start with small, simple movements in the upper body, so around the head and neck area. These might be eye blinking, um, nose scrunching, might be sniffing. Um, as the disorder progresses, the number of tics increases with age. They tend to move down the body and they tend to become more complex or more involved. So ticks tend to ramp up throughout uh, kind of the elementary school years, and then they peak in severity for most people um, somewhere age 10 to 13 on average. Um, so we're, we're thinking about the peak severity sometime middle school, very early high school. And this is, you know, a difficult time to have anything different about your behavioral appearance, behavior or appearance. So that plays a big role in how we kind of what comes up clinically. Uh, but there's also some good news, and the good news is that for a whole lot of folks, um, their tics decrease in severity um, into adulthood. Um, for about a third of folks, their tics don't change much, and they stay at that same level of severity um, that they experienced in their peak. For another third, they decrease somewhat, but still cause some mild problems. And then for the final third, the tics, um, we used to say they, they go away completely. People have done studies where you stick a video camera now on people and it turns out they don't go away completely, but they're so mild and so infrequent that they don't cause very much uh, difficulty at all for that last third. So what this means is that when we're talking about treating Tourette syndrome, we can think of it as primarily a disorder where you're going to work with youth, um, but also a disorder where there is a large adult population out there in need of services who's often overlooked in uh, service delivery and in research. Other important aspects of tic disorders, um, we see sex differences, so somewhere between a three to one, four to one male to female ratio, um, with, with the disorder being more common in boys than men. Um, there is some research showing that women with Tourette syndrome um, do perhaps have, have more impairment tics, possibly because they tend to place a lot of increased scrutiny on how the appearance of women and, and things like that. Um, 
Also important to think about comorbidity. So if you're working with people with Tourette syndrome, comorbidity, psychiatric comorbidity is the rule rather than the exception. Uh, the estimates of this vary a lot between studies um, for reasons that have to do with sampling and methodology that I think are interesting, but probably most of the folks that here uh, won't think are so interesting, so we'll just go right by them. The main thing to know is that a, a majority of people with Tourette's syndrome have some other psychiatric condition. OCD and ADHD are the most common, but we know from more recent studies that other anxiety disorders and learning problems are probably right up there in the mix. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it at that here. Comorbidity um, is often more impairing than the tics themselves for folks with Tourette syndrome. And it's important to understand in the clinical picture, tics are often not the highest treatment priority. A really important thing to touch on if we're gonna talk about treating tics and treating Tourette syndrome and just the disorder in general is premonitory urges. So premonitory urges are unpleasant somatic sensations that precede tics. Um, so this is something that many people don't know about Tourette's syndrome. Often when I'm meeting with families, uh, parents maybe don't know that their child experienced these, even though the child's very aware. Um, so this makes tics unlike um, some movement disorders like tremor. It makes them unlike a twitch you might have if you're tired, fatigued, and need um, to eat a banana or drink some Gatorade that people can feel these coming on. Um, there are these sensations that described as an itch, a pressure, tingling sensation, or just kind of a global, not just right feeling. Um, if you look at surveys of adults with Tourette syndrome, the vast majority report these kind of experiences. And clear birdies also report that these urges intensify when they suppress the tick um, temporarily, and that they experience some relief following the execution of the tick. So all this goes together to paint a picture where tics are experienced as voluntary responses to an involuntary sensation. The quotes you can see on the bottom are, are first person descriptive accounts from folks with Tourette syndrome of this. If you wanna get an idea of this, of what this feels like, I'll let you do this on your own while I talk. Just hold your eyes open and don't blink and don't blink and don't blink and don't blink and don't blink. And you feel that sensation or pressure building and you're not really sure exactly the word for it, but you know you don't like it. And then when you blink, you blink kind of hard and it goes away and you're like, whew, same kind of thing. Uh, kids have these premonitory urges too. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. There's some debate about whether very young kids experience them. In my experience, it just takes asking more questions of a five or a six year old or a seven year old uh, to pinpoint these urges. If you've ever tried to talk to a kid that age about any other internal sensation they have, like a stomach ache or how their heart, heart feels, they say some pretty variable and very cute things um, that, that also probably mean less psychometric validity to these measures in, uh, in young kids. But there's evidence that those sensations are there in, in younger children as well. So what are the available treatments for Tourette syndrome? Historically, medication has been the frontline treatment um, mostly uh, atypical antipsychotic medications. Risperidone is probably the most uh, widely used. Um, there's a lot of research on Abilify as well. Um, of course, before that, older generation antipsychotic medications, um, Haldol and uh, Pimzai, uh, these have big effects on ticks. They decrease ticks, not completely, but they have pretty substantial effects. They also um, have significant side effects. So these medications help a lot of folks, but the side effects can be a barrier to using these treatments for, for many, and some studies would suggest most people with Tourette's syndrome. Um, if you think about side effects when going on the medication plus um, anticipation of side effects or just generally not wanting to use meds. Um, we also have neurointerventional techniques. There are really neat studies showing that deep brain stimulation is an effective treatment for some treatment or refractory cases. Folks are trying to work out uh, sort of whether and how TMS can also be involved in this picture. Um, and then the, the third available treatment I'll talk about today that I think plays a big role is behavior therapy. So I'll just, before I get into all the clinical data, this is about to take a, a rather data heavy turn. So hooray if you like that and sorry if you don't. Um, I'll sum it up by saying the data supporting um, behavior therapy, when we're thinking about efficacy, 
tolerability and side effects or adverse um, events in clinical trials. They're strong enough to, to lead the American Academy of Neurology in 2019 and their recent guidelines to recommend behavior therapy as the first line treatment in the vast majority of, um, of cases of tic disorders. And this follows European and Canadian guidelines uh, over the last decade as well. So we're now in a place where the evidence recommends behavior therapy as the first treatment that people get in most cases ahead of medication. This is usually the part in a talk where I go deep into this behavioral model of tics and talk about really the specific places where we want to intervene on a behavioral level. I'm going to keep this pretty brief here, but happy to chat this up in the Q&A. Um, it's hard for me to keep this brief because I've spent a lot of the last decade researching this bit. Um, so I'll say first assumption, tick production is neurally driven. So myself, nor, I'm, I myself, nor anyone else who does this work would suggest that ticks are learned or relational in, in sort of the broadest sense, um, or that people are doing these on purpose or that they're anything other than a biologically driven disorder. Um, however, once uh, those, those biologically produced behaviors are out in the world, once they occur, the external environment can strengthen ticks. Um, this is something we have a, a pretty good amount of research on. These can be antecedent, uh, conditions or context. So you can think of these as tick triggers in sort of a lay sense. Um, and also social reinforcement um, in the sense of patterns of, of families responding to ticks in ways that are well-intentioned, empathic, and caring, um, or sometimes teasing too, uh, if you're looking at peers, that, that, as I put it, to my trick the brain into ticking more. Um, so based on this understanding, we can do a good functional assessment and then recommend changes to routines, family and peer reactions that might decrease these potential sources of reinforcement and change up the way some everybody i think we... and that was an awesome time for my wi-fi to die there you go <laughs> here we are um samantha are you able to share out my slides Able to see. Okay, amazing. Thanks. Yeah. And uh, cool. All right. So yeah. Speaking speaking of anxiety, there is a uh, presentation anxiety exposure right there. Um, so yeah, there's this urge relief feedback loop that maintains ticks. So what we want to do in treatment is think about teaching some inhibitory response that facilitates prolonged contact with that urge to, to make the ticks less automatic and ultimately decrease their frequency. Um, this is a fancy way of saying we wanna teach people to better inhibit their ticks. And the last premise that I've got written down here is that um, the vast majority of youth we know from lab-based studies um, can at least partially suppress their ticks when there is some, some reward uh, token reinforcement for doing so. So in therapy, can we bolster these skills and enhance that intrinsic motivation and uh, contact with natural rewards for, for managing ticks actively? Uh, next slide, please. Just to be clear, what I'm not saying is Tourette's syndrome. We don't think ticks are learned or done intentionally. We don't think that all patients can control their ticks or that any patient can control all of their ticks all of the time. 
Um, we don't think that failure to respond to behavior therapy reflects a failure on the part of the patient or the family. Um, and we also are not anti-medication. I'll say too, a lot of these premises, you know, you would see in any talk or if you talk to behavior therapists treating any condition, the longer I do this work, the more I appreciate that they are perhaps like even more true or true in different ways related to the, the ability to inhibit ticks in the moment. Um, that really just varies. And I've certainly uh, worked with some folks who really just cannot, even with what I am pretty confident is a very, very strong effort to that tick suppression. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, the backstory here, I'll go quick on this. Basically, psychology and psychiatry um, were kind of hampered in the early, early 1900s, provided uh, old school dynamic therapy for it that conceptualized ticks as coming from um, sort of id drives. You can imagine that was pretty stigmatizing, pretty aversive to folks, and um, didn't work too well. So this got kind of passed back over to, um, to medical treatment and, and neurology, and folks started treating ticks with Haudel in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, it's worth knowing at the same time, folks in the kind of off to the side subfield of applied behavior analysis um, were actually working on habit reversal, which is the crux of the treatment that I'll talk about today. However, there was really limited dissemination um, and, and really limited effort, honestly, to disseminate that um, to the mainstream medical or even clinical psychological community. There's a pretty parallel story there with autism. If you think about the um, time lag between some of Ivar Lovas's early work to when, when we see ABA-based treatment for autism really being taken into the mainstream. Um, so then sort of in the first decade of the 2000s, uh, there was this development of CBIT, Comprehensive Behavioral Intervention for Ticks. This was driven by the Tourette Association of America, really hearing from their patient constituents that um, the number one need that folks had, that folks expressed, was for this um, a, a non-medication intervention that worked. So they brought together folks who were kind of doing this work on the sidelines and folks who were more um, mainstream clinical trialists in uh, behavior therapy and, and developed this manual that was that really put the treatment, the crux of what was going on in different camps into one place and, and put it in language that folks could understand if they didn't speak the highly specific uh, language of behavior analysis. Um, I'll briefly show some data next from the CBIT efficacy, eh, eh, efficacy trials. Um, I'll, I'll show the data from the KID trial. There was also a parallel adult trial. It was conducted throughout the first decade of the 2000s, published in 2010 and 2012, and showed that, that CBIT had good efficacy. And then the last decade that I'll, of research that I'll talk about a little more is um, really on the implementation story. Next slide, please. All right. So talk a little bit about what CBIT is. Um, so this is a skill bit, skills based treatment, eight sessions given over eight to 10 weeks. Each session is about an hour, targets one tick per week. Um, the main components are function based assessment and intervention. So looking for ways that a person's routine or contact with different situations, people or events might be kind of tricking their brain into ticking more and looking at how different family reactions or social responses that, that people have to text might be, again, tricking their brain into ticking more, and then providing some recommendations to change that up. And then the other really core component is something called habit reversal therapy. Um, this is the part where we teach people to notice their ticks in real time, to do some behavior that inhibits the tick, um, ideally catching it at that promontory urge, blocking the tick from occurring, letting the urge do its own thing, and then delinking the urge from the tick itself. Um, the third component is social support. And this isn't what we usually mean by social support in psychology and mental health. This is really about having someone to um, give you an attaboy when you're doing the competing response, that tick inhibition skill, or give you a reminder um, if, the, uh, if the tick is occurring and you, you don't seem to be trying to apply that skill. Um, this is typically a parent for youth. Um, this is really an approach that tries to teach people how to fish 
Um, because ticks do wax and wane, we know folks will have new ticks that come up. So when we're coming up with these competing responses or these tick inhibition skills, are, um, we're doing this collaboratively and we really want the patient to be able to um, identify how to do that. Um, if they're young, we, are, we really embrace their parents being able to help as well. Um, I'll just say quickly where you see reward system, that's a reward system for engaging in treatment and doing the homework practice and homework is a big part of this intervention. Um, it is never a reward system for ticking more or less. That's not what we do. I'm gonna try and come back from my computer and see how that goes. All right. All right. Next slide, please. Um, and then I'll have to get to these questions at the end. I'll make sure to leave time. I couldn't track them on my phone and I now don't have them on my computer. Sorry. Um, if, if questions come up along the way, I'll try and keep a better eye on the chat. So I'll go through this efficacy trial really quick. Um, randomized 126 youth with persistent tick disorders to either get the CVIT treatment that I just mentioned or supportive uh, psychotherapy and education. The idea of using that as a control was that this is probably what people could get in the community with a provider who knew something about Tourette but didn't know any specialized behavioral treatment. Next slide, please. See, it worked if you look at efficacy. So this is global responder status um, at post-treatment. Um, this basically means what percent of participants had a game-changing response to their tics. Um, so you see 53% in CBIT and about an additional 25% uh, uh, had a smaller benefit from treatment. But you see in any case, 53% responding to CBIT, 19% responding to control. Pretty clear difference. Next slide, please. You see the same difference on a continuous uh, dependent measure of tick severity, the Yale Global Tick Severity Scale. Folks are in the same place at baseline. At the end of treatment, folks getting CBET are doing better than folks getting control. Uh, next slide. Same story for tick-related impairment. Next slide, please. Uh, this, this looks at how durable um, treatment response was. So if you look at the bars on the right, you see the percent of acute responders who maintain their responder status at uh, six months. And you see that's about 90%, 87% for CBIT. So vast majority of people who get better with this treatment stay better. There's some 10 year data from this study coming out soon that show that you see differences even that far out. Um, next slide, please. How do you benchmark this against medication? <laughs> you mess up the formatting of your own slides. That's how you do it. Sorry about that. Um, what, what this is doing is benchmarking the degree of symptom reduction you see with CBIT versus um, Zoprazidone and Risperidone. Um, so sort of index um, medications with good efficacy for Tourette syndrome. If you look at the third column, 31%, 36%, 35%, you see the overall tick reduction is um, is, is roughly comparable for the different treatments. Of course, we're comparing across trials, which is a little bit of a no-no. Um, if you look at the effect size, Cohen's D on the right, you see C bits in that same range, perhaps a little lower. One reason for that might be that um, you saw a bit more symptom reduction with uh, psychoid and supportive therapy than with a, a placebo. Um, but the, the bottom line is that we're talking about roughly comparable degrees of symptom reduction. Uh, perhaps a slightly lower, but, but again, I would say roughly comparable. Next slide, please. Oh, this is a head-to-head -head study out of Italy that just shows um, these are a slightly different form of behavior therapy, but they're compared it head-to-head -to, -head to pharmacotherapy and had pretty comparable outcomes on just about everything. Uh, next slide, please. 
Additional findings, just to touch on these briefly, um, if you look at adverse events in these studies, comparable, comparable rates for CBIT as for psychoeducation and supportive therapy, no serious study-related adverse events. And I should say, too, the, the AE rates were really low in both arms. As you might imagine, um, psychoeducation and support is not a, not a treatment with a lot of adverse um, effects. Uh, feasibility and acceptability was high. The vast majority of folks who started treatment completed treatment. People rated their experience as positive. And if you look at the adult study, you see really parallel patterns of adults. Um, you do see slightly lower overall response rates. So 33% to CBIT instead of 53 in the kids sample, but also 6% to control compared to 19% of control. Might just be that adults who, whose ticks tend to persist have a little bit of a more treatment refractory, refractory version of this disorder in general. Next slide, please. Okay, so it works. Now what? Um, at the time of these studies, uh, unless you happen to live near a specialized treatment center, uh, you pretty much didn't have access to behavior therapy. Um, I've thrown up some data from, from surveys of patients and providers there. So this was not a treatment that was widely available in most communities. And really at the time when I started doing this work in 2010, it's fair to say it wasn't even widely available in most academic medical centers. Um, there are also some broader challenges that I won't get into, but I'm sure y'all can imagine doing the work you do with Tourette syndrome diagnosis and linkage to care often involves traveling from a pediatrician to a child neurologist or child psychiatrist. And then uh, if we're talking about behavior therapy, then to a third provider often. So the tasks of implementation and, and scaling up this work, uh, training different kinds of providers. The treatment of Tourette syndrome is inherently quite multidisciplinary. Um, so there have been studies showing that yes, you can train occupational therapists to do this treatment with good fidelity and with good clinical outcomes. Yes, you can train uh, nurse practitioners working in pediatric neurology settings to do this treatment with good fidelity and with good outcomes. What I'll talk about more today is develop or implementable care modalities like teletherapy and self-help, understanding treatment in context, uh, we'll talk about a little, and uh, I'll just mention we did a downward extension study um, that showed you can do some slight developmental tailoring and get this treatment to work well in five to eight year olds too. The CBIT study included kids nine and up. Next slide, please. All right, so telehealth, what are different um, ways to use technology to get this out here? Um, <laughs> don't have to tell you all, it's 2020, you're doing some clinical practice. Teletherapy, um, which you see with this, I think kind of cute little picture here, um, involves a live therapist communicating in real time with a patient over video conferencing. Uh, Tick Helper, I put there as an exemplar of asynchronous online self-help. Um, so this is just another um, kind of option where you're not um, connecting in real time with the therapist, but you're working through an online version of a self-help program. And uh, Mike Himley and Doug Woods have also done some work with something called CBIT Trainer. So looking if you can um, sort of digitize the training so people can learn the treatment on their own without uh, attending a CE type workshop. Next slide, please. I'll talk mostly about teletherapy. Okay, so this work has actually been going on for a while. Um, it was originally done, uh, the first study on this was, you know, started about a decade ago. Uh, it was in this hub and spoke model where someone would go to a spoke clinic, a local clinic near their home and connect via specialized telehealth equipment um, with a provider um, at a specialized care setting. So a UCSF type place. Next slide, please. Uh, this study, 20 youth with uh, Tourette came in, two different sites, uh, UW-Milwaukee and University of Utah, and they were randomized to either get in-person CBIT um, at the site that they came to, or to go to that site and connect via telehealth with a provider at the other site. Next slide, please. What you saw is that both treatments work, both face-to-face -face and telehealth. Uh, if you look at the dimensional treatment data on the left, um, you see they, they track pretty carefully. If you're under, wondering, well, it's a small study, which one does a little better? I think I'd want to be in that one. It's actually teletreatment doing a little better um, than face-to-face. -face. Again, small study, and these are not statistically different. Um, but if you, if you do want to say there's a signal there of difference, it is not against telehealth. Next slide, please. 
So this was promising. Um, hub and spoke telecebit may be as efficacious as face-to-face. -face. This is a small study. It's not a non-inferiority design, but you know, effect sizes in the same ballpark. But still, there are barriers with this model. Next slide. Uh, can you click through a couple? I think I have some animation here. Cool. And then one more. Perfect. There. Oh, sorry. We go back one. Yeah. So you need specialized equipment. Uh, about six thousand dollars of specialized telehealth equipment per site were used in this study. Um, and in this kind of hub and spoke model, you do have specialized telehealth equipment. There's also a travel burden for people to get from their home to the quote unquote local clinic. Um, sometimes the local clinic is really not very local at all. Um, I'll leave it at that. Next slide. So this is easy to imagine in 2020, but what if we could do treatment right to people in their homes? It feels comical to say that now, um, but this was the thinking and, and kind of the next step in this implementation journey. Um, so can we just have folks using the regular computers at home to do therapy with folks? Um, and this was done you know, on the provider side in the office, um, though with a standard PC. So that was a design decision we made. We wanted to see what this would look like if the provider only had access to kind of run of the mill technology setup and not specialized telehealth equipment. Next slide. Um, so this is a study in 2016, a small pilot RCT comparing in-home telecebit to wait list. Uh, next slide. And what you see here was it, a little bit of a weird thing where there's this baseline, baseline difference, but people are responding to telecebit more than to a wait list. However, the symptom decrease might be a little smaller and the percent of global treatment response might be a little smaller. This was a study where data collected in 2013 and 2014, mostly folks in rural Wisconsin. So internet connectivity and hardware was not what it is today. Um, and these were people who didn't have a lot of other access to care. Next slide, please. So yeah, to this point, what do we have? In-home telecebit seemed to work better than a wait list. Maybe the effects were a little smaller, but some consideration. So yeah, I just mentioned technology wasn't what it was. Um, we can think about the end user tech skills. So, you know, we can think about our clients and their families were less um, maybe apt with technology than they would be today. Um, but also the therapists were too. We we're all just as a society at that time, less used to spending a lot of time on Zoom or comparable experiences. And there might also have been some sampling bias. Next slide, please. So now I'll talk about a study that um, I just wrapped up last year in collaboration with Carol Matthews and some other great folks at the University of Florida um, that was really further evaluating this in-home telecebit. All of our data on this collection on this study were pre-COVID. Um, so I, I just want to note that there, these are all those done in a different context. We, we wanted to see if given advances in tech, given advances in how much more accustomed to video chat we've all, we had all become at that point as a society, um, how this would go. And really importantly, we wanted to see how this would fit into a comprehensive medical tick program. So the studies I mentioned, they were done in these freestanding behavior therapy clinics that are not really representative of um, comprehensive care models. So what we did in this study was we wanted to actually embed it in a comprehensive Tourette syndrome care center, um, which I'll describe more in a second. And we want to include adults. So these prior studies only looked at youth. Next slide, please. The aims of this study, what I just said, we wanted to look at acceptability, feasibility, and effectiveness. Next slide, please. So the method um, did this. I was in San Jose um, in a <laughs> closet-sized room at San Jose State, providing this therapy over distance to people in Florida. Patients were recruited from sort of various points of contact uh, at the University of Florida in the UF healthcare system. Um, the, there were pediatric patients and adult patients. Um, they already had access by virtue of the fact that they were plugged into care to state-of-the-art medication management, face-to-face in-person CBIT, and uh, for treatment refractory cases, that was actually somewhere they could get DBS too. So in green, you see the added service here through the study was in-home telecBIT. Next slide, please. 
<laughs> I wanted to, <laughs> to screenshot a, a little picture of where UF is to tell you something about the catchment area. And when I went to do this on Google Maps, I loved the description of this. University of Florida, school known for research and sports. Perfect. We're doing uh, research here. And as an undergraduate who graduated from University of Florida, I can tell you something about the sports side. Next slide. That was some of the experience, research and sports, University of Florida. Good job, Google Maps. Next slide, please. More seriously though, checking out the catchment area of this clinic, if you wanna know about other comprehensive care centers for Tourette syndrome in Florida at the time of the study, there was one in Tampa. Um, now there's more services in Miami. Uh, Barbara Coffey moved down there and has, has set some great stuff up. Um, but at the time, you know, there's one clinic in Tampa that had about an hour long wait list, really nothing else in the state and you could drive four hours north to Atlanta was the other option. Um, so a, a large catchment area, both in Northern Florida, but we had people in the study all the way from the tip of the pain handle down to Miami. Next slide. This is a setup of the study. Um, so people were seen and offered this teletreatment, this telecebit at their, their regular clinic visits at UF. Some of these were initial consults. Some of these were follow-up visits um, every six months, 12 months or so on. Um, so we tracked just the number of people offered the study. And then uh, if they were interested, they could call into San Jose State, talk to me, um, get set up, get consented. Um, if they enrolled, they then did a baseline assessment with a treatment blind independent evaluator at the University of Utah. I mean, they didn't go to Utah, it was just on uh, VC, basically on Zoom. Um, if they met the full criteria for the study, they would do eight sessions of CBIT with me, but again, on telehealth, and then post and follow-up assessments. Next slide. These were the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Basically, we took a really wide range of clinical severity a wider range of comorbidity and people on a wider range of psychiatric medication. Um, we excluded certain comorbidities, bipolar, schizophrenia, autism, and intellectual disability. Uh, next slide, please. Here's our, our sample. This is, I'll just say briefly here, pretty representative of, of clinical research samples in Tourette syndrome, a range of comorbidity. So this wasn't a highly selected sample in that sense. Um, more boys than girls. You can see the mean age right around 12.2 years. And the baseline tick severity is really comparable to other behavior therapy studies and medication studies. Next slide, please. This was the adult sample. Uh, you saw, I put that age distribution there because there was a chunk of folks in kind of that young or tra transitional age youth range, um, young adults, and then a, a range of folks at other ages. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. I'll go quick here and just point out uh, the number all the way on the left. We wanted to know how many people would actually want this when we offered it. And we saw that 25% of youth and 23% of adults who were offered telecebit began treatment. And to summarize all the rest of this, um, it wasn't because people didn't meet our inclusion and exclusion criteria. That wasn't a big weed out factor. So about a quarter of people um, who were offered this wanted it, initiated it, and, and were able to begin treatment. Uh, everyone who began treatment did finish treatment. Next slide, please. Treatment was highly acceptable. This is the overall satisfaction item on the treatment acceptability questionnaire. People liked it. Next slide, please. Everyone who started treatment began treatment. Uh, about 87%, so roughly nine out of 10 sessions were conducted um, without any significant tech problems. So yes, yeah, some of these sessions in that 87% had slight video lags, slight audio cutout, the kind of hiccup, what a good example, like we just had today, where there was some hiccup or something that was suboptimal, but 87% of sessions had either something just super minor that didn't get in the way of us accomplishing the goals of the session, or no tech issues at all. And uh, 
you know, as you saw, these are people in really a spread of different situations using regular equipment in their homes, um, just on their home Wi-Fi with their home computers. Uh, we didn't have any study related adverse events. Um, as you all know, doing telehealth, you get the, the patient safety nightmares, um, which are, are often well founded. We didn't wind up making any emergency calls to local providers. Um, we did um, do some planning in advance for that. Next slide. So yeah, about a quarter of people did this. Um, this is just repeating what I just said. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. We want to see if it worked. Um, this is tick severity pre and post treatment. Um, perfect. You can go to that next one. What you see in the blue is the, the youth sample for the study. 68% of them had a clinically significant treatment response. I benchmarked it against the main CBIT trial there, and you can see the degree of symptom reduction is really, really similar. So treatment worked to decrease ticks. Next slide, please. Treatment also worked to decrease tick-related impairment. Next slide, please. That was similar to the face-to-face -face study. Next slide, please. <laughs> it also happened on a parent report measure. Next slide, please. In the adult sample, people also got better. We saw a predeposed significant decrease in overall tick severity. Seven out of the 10 adults had a global, uh, clinically significant global treatment response. Next slide, please. That tracks well with the face-to-face -face trial. Next slide, please. Significant decrease in tick-related impairment as well. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, treatment was effective and the people who, who got to the treatment, who did it, um, completed it and liked it a lot. Uh, and, and the, the effectiveness, I'm going forth between effectiveness and efficacy here. This was somewhere kind of in the middle of this study on that continuum. Um, but the, the treatment effects were, were in the ballpark of what we see with in-person treatment. Again, this was a single arm trial, so you can't really compare, um, but roughly in that same ballpark. Next slide, please. Oh, next slide, please. So yeah, some considerations with this. This is a single arm uncontrolled trial. That wasn't the initial plan, but that's what happened. We can talk about um, why sometime also. Um, selection bias is important here. So we're looking at treatment response among people who chose to initiate this treatment which is true to some extent in all clinical trials, but perhaps a little more. It's just worth particularly taking into context here because this was a single arm trial. So people were opting into this particular treatment, not treatment in general, or not one of many different treatment options. Um, you might think uh, of a treatment limitation as being a single, that there was a single expert therapist. So I was doing the therapy at the start of the study I had had, ooh, six, seven years of, of a lot of experience doing this. So that would be a big no-no as far as thinking about, you know, effectiveness trials or external validity, right, typically. However, part of what this model does, is it possible for people in a variety of different locations to connect with specialized care and specialized providers? So you can think about this as a limitation, but it's also a feature of this telehealth model that you're connecting with a specialized provider. Um, the biggest thing here, I think, is that the degree of treatment uptake we saw leaves a whole lot of room for improvement. Um, so I will talk a little more about this quickly, but yeah, 75% of people offered didn't begin treatment. Um, this was treatment in their home for free with a specialized care provider. And due to, the, due to the time difference, I could give them after school appointments, no problem. That was also a nice part of doing this work. You could see a kid at 6 p.m. their time and it was 3 p.m. here. Um, and this was a bit surprising to us. And what I wanna say as someone who likes this treatment a lot and has done a lot of behavior therapy, you know, in a sort of mainstream medical, clinical psych, psych psychiatric model is that people don't know enough about this treatment or they don't have the right beliefs, attitudes, or motivation. But I had that reaction at first. It's kind of frustrating. I said, Ugh, why didn't they want treatment? But I think what we need to do when this happens and when we see this related to our treatments is really step back and think about um, 
what's different between the way we as providers and our treatments are conceptualizing these problems and where is that missing how people are seeing them as fitting into their life next slide so i'm going to cut this short um just so we can get to q a next slide you I'll, I'll just say briefly yeah people have also developed there there's some data coming out that these online self-help versions also work nothing has compared them face to face so basically what we have to do now is we have like we started the day when i started doing this work there was no kind of clearly supported efficacious treatment at least with that kind of large multi-site clinical trials evidence then we got that one flavor of ice cream that one thing face to face seva that worked really well now we have a bunch of different flavors that have empirical support face to face seva teleseva self help seva um and see it with all these different providers. What we need to know is how to put those together to make care systems that actually work and actually reach people. Um, and I have some extra slides there um, that, that'll be posted publicly and you can check out some resources for different trainings for learning more about the clinical end of things. Um, I wanna thank my many collaborators and, and funder for this study. And um, I guess I'll just conclude by saying um, Samantha, can you maybe uh, unshare the slides? Thanks. I'll just conclude by saying, I think as we think about implementation and dissemination, you know, this has been a pretty traditional implementation dissemination story that I've laid out. I think on top of doing more work to build up access and let people know about treatments, for Tourette syndrome, I think it's really important and for other disorders to start thinking more deeply about the folks who are aware of these treatments and have access and are just finding ways to live with these these uh disorders we would call them um in ways that don't involve medication or therapy and people are finding ways to thrive and i think you know we say that and that's always there in the literature right is that based on the degree of impairment people may or may not choose to see treatment and we think about autonomy but i think it's another thing to take that really seriously and do some bottom-up research figuring out what people are doing with this. And I think what we might learn is that we can learn a lot about, in one sense, how to improve what we recommend to families, but I think we can just learn a lot about what helps people live with these really difficult neuropsychiatric conditions from just learning what people are doing out in the world, on top of the evidence-based behavior therapy that I'm gonna keep doing and keep uh, you know, training and working on. So I'll leave it with that. Sorry for going a couple of minutes over, but I can do questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I so appreciate it, that last piece, and, I, and that really coincides with um, a critical question that some of our um, um, audience members have posed in the chat. Um, I really, I just want to say, Matt, I really appreciate your um, bringing what I'll just speak personally, what seems like an intimidating disorder to treat, right? There's like all these um, biases that we have about like, oh, I can't treat that. Um, and I appreciate your bringing um, home to us that this is um, a, a treatment that is feasible and acceptable um, and safe. Um, and that um, a multidisciplinary approach is effective that all, you know, many providers can exercise this, can implement this. Um, so with that, my, uh, a question that's come up is around the adaptations to CBIT for telehealth um, and delivery and thinking about how, what, what are some adaptations that you found in your own practice that have led to increased engagement, for instance, um, that we could apply then to other EBTs as we're, you know, expanding our reach via telehealth? Yeah, this is a really good question. So yeah, what are kind of the bigger lessons learned here through this? Some of it's basic, some of it is a lot of this, you have to see the ticks and see people. So making sure people have a good telehealth setup. I say this as I'm like crammed into a corner of my tiny apartment doing this talk, right? Um, but you can not, see being you. Afraid to, <laughs> not being afraid to ask people to move around or like get far back from their computer, like taking kind of that collaborative experimentation approach. Um, thinking about ways to leverage that technology so you can actually have people get their homework and practice it where they um, practice doing uh, tick inhibition and competing responses, where they actually do their homework. This is really good for generalization. Um, thinking about uh, 
you know, you're working with a little kid, you'd normally be using a five minute break in the middle of session as a, a motivator to keep them on track, right? If you stay engaged and follow the rules for five minutes, you can do that. And then they're at home, so you can have them go like, show you their pet rock collection or put some music on Spotify and have a dance party. Like, I think it's just about falling back on taking a principle-based approach and not getting too stuck in a manual and just thinking, okay, now I need to think about what can I do to motivate this kid on telehealth? And how can I get to see what I need to see and do what I need to do there? And how can I leverage it to, to really take advantage of the fact that we are in the environment where they're gonna be doing this? I also have in the slides an hour long webinar we did specifically on this, if you want a longer answer. It's one of the links at the end. That's great, because a, a few folks have asked for resources, so, and you beat them to the, to the punch. So there, there you are. Um, another question that's come up is around um, how to maintain improvement, uh, and particularly thinking about families, like post-treatment, what are families doing that are really improving or, or, or helping to maintain gains that, um, um, that children and, and teens have made in the therapy? Yeah, 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 really good question. So we have some, some data that are not quite published because page limits um, from the, the CBIT Junior study we did, where we actually measured change in uh, essentially parent accommodation or, or kind of in the moment responsiveness to ticks. And what we saw was the families who decreased in that, who were less reactive to ticks during treatment, that predicted gains at one year. So that would suggest that the part of this is, you know, families changing up the way they respond to ticks. What I think is just as much and really more of a part for older kids, teens and adults is this sort of shifting of ticks from something that happens to them where their body is kind of attacking them in a way to something where they have some agency and can actively manage on their own terms. Um, we don't have data on that because we haven't measured that, but the more I talk to people, less in a clinical lens, and as we do this work, really looking more for kind of the bottom up answers, that's what we hear from people, is that the biggest thing they get out of it is that they have something to do now to manage their ticks. Thank you for that. That, that coincides with another question that um, um, recommendations for rewards for different ages that both clinician and a family member may, be, may implement or the, the, the child themselves um, themselves can implement um, to uh, sustain progress. Yeah, so again, and I'm not hearing this in the question, but just to make sure it's clear, never, ever, ever are we giving rewards to kids based on how much they tick. I've done that in lab studies to understand tick suppression, but that's not what we do in treatment. So what you're doing when you look at coming up with rewards for treatment engagement is really what you'd be doing for any treatment. So often, I mean, the standard that I use and then tailor as necessary is kids earn a point for coming to session, a point for following the rules in session, or with a teenager, I just call it participating all the way because who likes to follow rules, right? Um, and then another point for doing the homework. Uh, then once they get to 20 points, because I'm thinking I'll probably see them for eight sessions, so 24 points, they don't have to be perfect, they just have to be good. Then we, we set some, some reward early on, talking with them and with parent. Um, some usually activity-based reward that will be motivating to them. Um, so that might be like a trip to the Santa Cruz boardwalk, it might be those like, nice new jeans at the mall that would be kind of a special treat it might be going out for a special dinner yeah asterisk asterisk COVID I know it sounds ridiculous to say now um for younger kids we're going to make rewards for immediate so they're going to be earning something maybe every week and we're going to just in session if they um if they engage all the way in session and show up to that session we're going to spend the last five minutes doing something they want to do playing a game having them Tell me all about Minecraft. Um, I was saying that one. Actually, I got it in my real answer. Don't be afraid to use having kids like just gush to you about Minecraft or whatever they're into. I, I think that's the most underrated reward in behavior therapy is adults being interested in the thing that your parents roll their eyes at. <laughs> 
I so appreciate that. Um, so that's all the time that we have, um, unfortunately. Um, uh, so grateful uh, for your time and for all the work that you do, um, Matt. So, and, and, and stay safe and be well in these trying times for all of us. Um, excellent thank job. You. And you can see in the chat all these, thank you, awesome, wonderful, learned a lot. So I, I appreciate your time. Thanks, y'all. And if you're doing this, if you do have follow-up questions, I am an easy get as far as hopping on the phone for a couple minutes um, to help folks out. So if, if, if this is work you want to do, you know, look at the slides and look at the resources, but just let me know if this is something you want to learn more about, and I'll, I'll be happy to chat, you know, how that fits for you. Fantastic. Thanks, thank you. Bye, everyone.